Hi everyone, welcome to The Road to Psychology. I'm your host, Deirdre Gardner. This week is something a little bit different. It's some tips for coping at Christmas from Dr. Claire Hayes. Um, Claire was my first guest on the first ever episode of the podcast, so I'm so grateful to her for coming back. I'd like to thank everyone for their support this year. It's been an amazing experience and I've learned so much. I hope you have too. And wish you all a Merry Christmas. I'll speak to you in the new year. Thanks again. Okay, so I'd like to welcome Dr. Claire Hayes, uh, back by popular demand. Thanks so much for doing this today, Claire. Oh, Deirdre, you're so welcome. It's a real pleasure. Thank you for asking me. So I suppose this is a little bit different than I've usually done, but it's kind of coping at Christmas would be the topic I'd like to discuss uh, for people who find Christmas difficult. Um, so you were really kind in sharing a resource, like a really good resource you created for AWARE with some tips about dealing with Christmas and so obviously there's 17 tips in the resource, so I couldn't go through 17, but I've picked some of the ones that really resonated with me. I thought today is aimed at people who find Christmas difficult, or maybe they're going to find this Christmas particularly difficult. Maybe they're away from family, or they've lost someone this year, or for any reason, even with mental health difficulties and things. Um, my personal motivation for doing this is my father passed away when I was eight uh, at Christmas. So I've had my share of terrible Christmases. <laughs> So I suppose I'm the expert on terrible Christmas, so then you're the expert on mental health. <laughs> um, but yeah, I suppose if we start with number three of your tips there would have been music. Can you discuss how a tip about music for Christmas? Yes, I can. But you didn't think I was going to let you get away with that one, did you? <laughs> yeah, <no. laughs> <laughs> so expert who on earth is an expert and I have a huge passion in helping myself and everybody else understand and manage anxiety and sometimes I do it better for myself or not and my dad Lord Reston used to say do you ever listen to yourself Claire when you're teaching so I am absolutely no way an expert on this and in terms of you experiencing Christmas as challenging I really did not like the build up to Christmas dirt for years and years and years. And um, my parents worked very hard in business. And um, when I was a child, the shop was open until maybe 11 o'clock at night, half 11 at night. And then we went to midnight mass. We'd be up very early on Christmas morning to drive from Cavan down to Waterford so that mum would be there in time to get the dinner. So it was, it was a rush. I loved, I've always loved the switch off once we get to midnight mass and once we get to Christmas morning and midnight mass actually. And, and then I love January. Other people are very different. I couldn't understand why some people loved the rush and the fuss and they, I just couldn't understand that until a few years ago when I decided that actually in terms of managing myself and just the thoughts that were in my head and basically changing my attitude. So the tips are really based on things that I have found helpful for myself. And the one you're asking me about music, that was a deliberate decision a number of years ago to change the, the stuff in my head, the busyness, the... Um, so I created a, a space for myself that was just safe and quiet. And it was my car. And I got a CD, a really nice one with, I think the first one was classical music. And I just played it and I got into being the chauffeur. So I was very, very happy. Anytime I used to always help out at Christmas time. So up until two years ago. So anytime anybody wanted anything done, I put my hand up and say, I'll do, I'll drive, I'll drive 16 miles, I'll drive 20 miles. Doesn't matter. I'll drive. And I'd get into the car, put on my CD. And then I was just completely transformed into my space where my little world was relaxation. And I was just amazed by how it, how effectively it worked so then every year i would have um part of my getting ready for christmas would be to choose whatever cd i wanted to choose and in the article i mentioned john murray he put together two years in a row fabulous christmas music and it was on behalf of aware and there were beautiful ones and ones that i hadn't heard and i've come to love those i remember susan boyle's cd was one another year and getting ready for this conversation i just collected my car from the garage just um before i was talking to you and it's shinshke <laughs> lele but it's been in the garage for six weeks eight weeks so i haven't actually been driving and that that was the first thing that made me realize how different for me this year is covid19 christmas 2020 is because i'm not in the car i'm not getting that space so as i drove my car back i thought I don't have a Christmas CD this year because I haven't had my car. So it's a good reminder for me to maybe 
maybe do it differently, maybe to listen to my iPod or put nice music on. But yes, that's a Christmas tip. I can really relate to that. Your car being your space, you know, I think it's really good if you have a drive after something or before it because it kind of helps you decompress and your car your car is your space you know yes. uh, but music I thought was a really interesting one there because for me personally Christmas music has always made me really sad and I think it's because um maybe at sad times that music was playing and music can really bring up emotions for me yes. but something that's worked for me is to listen to music in another language like Christmas music in Spanish or something <laughs> or just instrumental music Yes, I find that doesn't it doesn't bring up um, sadness. Like it's not even related to a certain thing. It's just a, an emotion that comes up when I hear Christmas music. It's strange. It doesn't, it doesn't even have to be Christmas music. I was just talking my, to my sister. She dropped me out to collect my car, and she's just heading off for a five hour journey. And I was asking her, would she be okay? And what would she would she listen to the radio? And she said yes. And she said, and she has ABBA. And she said she just enjoys it. She knows the words, all the songs, and she'll sing along. And I thought, yeah. So that that's her space. And yeah. I'm. Not mommy saying that, but <laughs> so it, it doesn't have to be Christmas music. It can be anything, yeah. you know. Yeah. But music that music that makes that, that oh my goodness, to use a, um, language here, but music that nurtures us, nurtures our soul, that really we resonate with. And sometimes I, it's really good to cry. So with the build up, and maybe it's again the car is a safe place, just so long as we've nice tissues. And if there's music that we're listening to that does touch us in a way that we're okay that we know what's going on and that we're safe to drive obviously maybe it's all right to have a few tears trickling down yeah well that's true um i suppose the next one i think this is probably the most it was one that really stood out to me was the managing expectations yeah um look it's interesting with expectations now this year with covid19 we've been hearing all year that christmas is going to be different this year and there's for some people, not everybody, but for some people, there's an expectation that it's going to be worse, that people won't be visiting family and that there'll be a lot of people who'd be very lonely. And, and obviously some of that is true, but it doesn't have to be true 100% of the time for 100% of the people. I was um, out of Ireland one Christmas and I remember my expectation was that you know, I was going to find it really, really, really difficult. And I was actually in Australia. So it was bizarre to see Christmas trees and Christmas decorations and plum puddings and when they were having it. <laughs> but I managed my expectations by not expecting to enjoy it. Mm. And I think that was for me the, the, the key thing. And then I was really surprised because I did. And I knew it wasn't going to be the same as every other Christmas, but it was different in a way that turned out to be absolutely amazing. And it was, it was a huge gift. So I think for those of us now who are forced to have a different Christmas, there are moments where we will feel uh, sad or upset or lonely and we will miss our family members. But with modern technology, we can Zoom, we can FaceTime, we can phone, and then we can enjoy doing things differently. And if there's only maybe three or four people, maybe playing Ludo or Snakes and Ladders or Snap or maybe actually in peace watching something on TV rather than thinking, well, we shouldn't be doing this because we've got the family over and we're, or whatever. So managing our expectations, really allowing ourselves to take in, it is going to be different. There's no doubt about that. It is going to be different. But the, the bottom line, when I've been thinking of COVID, I was reminded, I'm, I'm managing on how to cope with it. I was thinking of a measure I used in 1988 in terms of helping people in, in, in looking at how people cope with stress. And it's um, by Harris. So there are five measures. There's cognitive, social, spiritual, philosophical, physical, and emotional. Did I say that? So cognitive, what we're thinking, social. So thinking of Christmas and our expectations. So what are we thinking about so are we thinking it's going to be terrible, it's going to be awful, we're going to be really lonely. So if that's, what, if that's what's in our head, just putting in a maybe, maybe it won't be. Maybe it won't be as bad. Maybe there'll be something nice in it. Social, yes, we're not going to be able to, or no, we're not going to be able to give people hugs, but maybe there's other ways. Maybe we can go for a walk in the, you know, early on a Christmas morning and just put a note at somebody's, in somebody's door, just wishing you happy Christmas, or just 
a poster and little Adam Kelly's virtual hugs. You know, if we could just go for walks, <laughs> waving the virtual hug, would not be a Christmas tree member forever. If everybody in the country did that on, on Christmas morning and we just waved a virtual hug, that's an idea for us all. And then there's emotional, and that's an ability to be in touch with our emotions. So yeah, feeling sad. I miss my dad on Christmas Day, but I miss him every day. You mm. must miss your dad on Christmas Day. So allowing us to ourselves to feel sad, but not for the whole day. So allowing us to do that for a little while. And then the physical. So that's exercise, diet, things that we'd normally think of in terms of helping us cope with stress. But the one I found really intriguing and very powerful is the fifth one, the spiritual stroke philosophical. And that's one we think of Brian Keenan or Nelson Mandela or Viktor Frankl or anyone who's experienced really, really extreme hardship. When they've been asked how they survived and how they coped with it, they talk about a bigger picture. They talk about something over and above beyond what they're suffering. Something, there's a bigger meaning, deeper meaning. So when we're thinking of Christmas this year, managing our expectations, yes, it is going to be different, but why is it going to be different? Because we are protecting people we care about, people we love from getting COVID-19. And we know that people at a certain age can be vulnerable. We know that people who have underlying health difficulties at any age can be vulnerable. So we could go into a moan fest, but if we allowed ourselves to have, you know, three minutes moan, and then the rest of it is maybe even using imagery to think of all the people who are here for Christmas, this Christmas, because of the restrictions we've had earlier in the year. Because last March, if we hadn't gone into lockdown and if we had lived the way we were living, there would be a lot of people not here this Christmas. So that's, again, managing our expectations. That's really beautiful. I never thought of that. All the people that are here that wouldn't be here. That's amazing. With expectations, I actually had a, like, obviously it's expectations, but it's kind of the opposite. It was like, I used to, as a child, I suppose this is natural. I used to think Christmas was going to be amazing. And then it would be really sad. <laughs> and I'd have every year, probably for 10 years, you know, like feeling really disappointed and like disappointed in myself that I wasn't enjoying it and disappointed in Christmas in general. And then I pared back my expectations completely. And then it just became easier. Do you know, when you don't expect it to be, like if, you're, if you have depression all year round, you still have depression Christmas Day. Do you know, it's not going to go away. If you're grieving, you still have grief on Christmas Day. It, it's just a day in the well, year, really, do you know? You, you do, but it's more intense. Because yeah. Because the time where we're supposed to, we're expected to feel better. And, you know, some people volunteer with the wear on Christmas Day because that's, and volunteer with other charities and go and give Christmas dinners because that's their way of helping others. But also there's, I think, a tiny piece of, of escape. It's creating their own, their own traditions. But if we think of, of depression, you're absolutely right. But people who experience severe depression can find it really difficult in times of, like say, the summer holidays or a beautiful, beautiful day in the summer where everybody's saying, isn't it great to be alive? Isn't this wonderful? And, and how they're, what they're experiencing with the depression is even more obvious. Whereas in a cold winter, bleak night where people are going, oh, and there's a lot of complaints, and then it's kind of easier to be miserable, if that makes sense, or easier to feel down or easier to feel depressed. So Christmas is like the summer day thing. It's suddenly this time where we're all supposed to feel wonderful. And expectations, again, managing expectations. There are parents... We, we won't have the scenes at Dublin Airport this year that we've had Cork and Limerick that we've had, or yeah, Shannon and Galway that we've had other years where people are, you know, coming home. But the sense of I'm coming home and it's like people forget <laughs> that what happens when families get together at Christmas and adults suddenly can revert back to being kids <laughs> and the siblings and the rows and the jealousies and they, you know, all of that stuff. And it's like, you know, we can kind of forget that every year. And um, then, so it's, it's managing the expectations around, you know, yes, it is a day. And it's a special time, but we're human. And also, I, I think this is going back to my own childhood. I, just my sense was that by the time Christmas Day came, everybody in my family was so exhausted. You know, there was kind of like, maybe tendency to be slightly cranky, or, you know, and then yeah. that's probably why I love January so much, because as the weeks went on, people unwound and relaxed. And then it was just such a nicer, nicer place to be. But 
so knowing and everybody's different so knowing what what our family is and then the expectations as well around the christmas present stuff and the cards and it's again one of the gifts of covid19 this year is looking at what do we need to make us feel good what do we need what is it that we need to go shopping every single day before christmas to buy loads and loads and loads of presents to give to loads of people to have loads of christmas outings or to get all of that or can we look after ourselves in a different way so that we do the best we can to to feel as good as we can mm -hmm. i think a lot of the suffering as well comes from say you're at home with your family and it's a difficult time and that you think everybody else is in matching pajamas drinking eggnog around a christmas tree just singing carols or something can you dispel that myth Claire, as a mental health professional yeah. with all your experience <laughs> Well, yeah, no, that's, that's so true. And like, that's a comparison piece, Deirdre. So like we compare ourselves, we compare ourselves harshly. Well, I do anyway, but I think everybody does to how we think we should be, to how we think we used to be. And that might not be how we were, how we used to be. So we can compare this Christmas to how we think it should be, to how we think it used to be and how we think everybody else's Christmases. And we can feel hard done by or, you know, annoyed or frustrated or, or whatever. And you know, one of the best Christmas I remember is the year that we burnt the turkey. Well, I didn't, but, you know, <laughs> and everybody else would say, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't. But, um, you know, and we just, you just get on with it. And then that becomes part of, do you remember? Do you remember when that happened? And, um, and then, then, you know, there's new memories created as well. Mm -hmm. There was something else I was going to say. I'll give you a chance to say something else and I remember what it was. I suppose other people's expectations as well, like that you're projecting onto them there. Like if you think um, everyone expects me to send them a Christmas card or everyone expects me to call to them Christmas Eve, you know, and you, really you're making that up in your head to make yourself unhappy. You know? Yeah, absolutely. And they, they, oh, look, if people are experiencing anxiety, I tend to have an experience of anxiety, tend to be very perfectionist. So mm. it's like everything has to be ready. Everything has to be done. Everything has to be a certain way. And who says who says yeah. maybe it doesn't and maybe it's okay and then managing our expectations as well around children so we know that parents go to the ends of the world to get absolutely whatever they can and santi is mighty and he's got clearance to fly and he's got his covid 19 test and everything but we do know there will be children who will be opening presents and parents will be going what? expecting them to be grateful, delighted, thrilled and quiet <laughs> for maybe <laughs> a <laughs> and maybe half an hour later I'm bored or I didn't get what I wanted or whatever. And, you know, we're human. And so allowing, allowing all of that, allowing the, the, the tiredness. And then in the middle of all of that, the magic of Christmas, the moments and one of my most beautiful Christmas memories is walking in and while we were getting ready for Christmas dinner and, and just walking into the sitting room and my dad was listening. He was watching um, something on TV and it was very unusual. When I was growing up, we, we didn't have TV on. We, we never watched it because my parents had a, a TV and electrical business. So it was the one day away from it. So we didn't watch it. So as we got older and anyway, it was on. So it was unusual to see dad sitting watching TV on a Christmas morning anyway. But he was watching the Vienna um, dancers um, the, the um, Danube, the waltz of the Danube. I'm not good at music, so I can't remember. Over my head, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so it was, it was classical music. It was yeah. the, um, the, Vienna, the Vienna waltz, I think. Okay. But it was done showing dancers walk, dancing and um, ballerinas and ballet dancers and incredible costumes, absolutely beautiful. It was magical. And I just sat and I thought, you know, I can get into trouble in the kitchen for disappearing, but I'm sitting here. And I just sat with them and, and we watched it for about a half an hour. And that's one of my most special memories of Christmas. So when I hear that music, no matter what time of the year it is, I'm transported back to that very, very special connection. So there are people who are here with us this Christmas who won't possibly be with us next Christmas. And just, just capturing that too. So uh, I think that's important in our expectations. So we can allow ourselves to enjoy it as well. Yeah, definitely. The next one I picked was balance. I think that's really important. Like just keep um, the basics, keep drinking water, keep getting movement, try and eat some fruit and vegetables, <laughs> you know, yeah. try and get enough sleep. And I think that would go a long way in if you're really if you're struggling at Christmas that would go a long way in getting you through it yeah 
Yes, we know that exercise is really important, but we also know it's managing our thoughts while we're exercising. So if we're going for a walk thinking I should be walking faster or slower, or I should be more mindful, or I shouldn't be thinking what I'm just thinking. Well, the walk, yes, we get benefits, but not as much. So if we deliberately put in balance, and even the sentence, I choose to have a balance. So that might help us, of course, Christmas day, and there's lots of food and, and around the Christmas period, but even just reminding ourselves, I choose to have a balance. That makes it easier to say no to the 10th mince pie or, or whatever it is. And then also a balance in, obviously, alcohol. I mean, anybody who follows Alcohol Action Ireland would know, really, you're better off keeping alcohol away from Christmas. There are children who, their Christmas is destroyed, their families are Christmas is destroyed because people don't have a balance around alcohol. And somehow it's like at Christmas that we're, were allowed and there could be in terms of going back to the expectation piece Deirdre that some people could be giving themselves permission already to make up for not having as good a Christmas in quotations because it doesn't have to be that but not having as good a Christmas by oh well we'll have lots and lots of wine or we'll have lots and lots of this or and we know that is not helpful in our healthy in so many ways so really alcohol keeping it to a balance and and that's that's not a a popular thing for me to say because you know we're Irish we're supposed to have you know we have the reputation of being the, the drinking nation and, and it's good fun and you know but you don't have to be a killjoy if you decide well actually you know what I've I'm, I'm just going to stick with the one thanks very much or I'm yeah I think I'll switch to boiling water or coffee or you know I might come back and have another drink later on so watching the balance and then the sugar are I'm only becoming as I get older, more aware of the impact of sugar on me and the kind of the hyperness and the craving. And so it can take a little while after Christmas for all of that to, to just to ease out of the system. And then the balance with the caffeine, the balance with the, the Netflix or the TV or the staying up late. And so in managing our, our own well-being, our mental health and our physical health, there's a phrase you don't remember, you're too young, but Amara's a day helps us work, rest and play. And they had really catchy music. So I am absolutely not advocating Amara's a day. <laughs> but, <laughs> but whatever it is, helps us work, rest and play. So, so substituting the Mars a day. So a walk a day helps us work, rest and play. Or a nice ch chat with somebody or, you know, a, a healthy meal a day. And, and using that as a slogan for ourselves. I personally stopped drinking when I was 23. It just, I tried it and I, I was much happier and that completely tra transformed Christmases for me. <laughs> because you have your car outside, you can, you can always drive, you can always leave when you want to leave. <laughs> yes. Just, yes. it's like you'd stop pouring petrol on a fire, you know, it's from a, it's Christmas is already an emotional time for me and just without drinking, it's, it's much, much easier. Financially as well. Yeah, no, that, that's, that's really, really great to hear. And, and people who think, you know, teenagers, I have this conversation with teenagers all the time, and they think they have to drink because they're under pressure. They have to. So I'm saying, well, if that's important to you to be, you know, part of the crowd in that, and, and at a certain age it is, obviously, well, take a beer can and empty it and fill it with water or a bottle and just sip away. And nobody will know and nobody will care. And for, for the kind of... 16, 17, 18 olds who are feeling hard done by if they, you know, or, or if they think they're not drinking. And I'm saying to them, just notice, notice what's happening. Notice as you're sober, notice what's going on. Because people say cut down on drinking. I mean, people who have an alcohol problem, a problem with alcohol, I always encourage them to cut it out because it's actually impossible to cut it down because once they have one drink, well, then it affects our, our the cognitions. And then the thought is, oh, it doesn't matter. And then any resistance or any uh what's the word dedication or ability to to withstand the temptation there's some word i can't think of but whatever that is goes out the window willpower that's what i'm trying to say <laughs> what our willpower it just it just gets drowned in in all of the alcohol and then it's oh look i'll do it tomorrow and actually the diet as well you know for people who have difficulties with their weight and people who have eating disorders and we know that depression is linked with uh, all kinds of different things but anyone who's experiencing anorexia depression is in there massively in there and expectations i love your question on that one Deirdre, because it links in with everything 
but people's expectations that they expect people with bulimia they expect to eat and eat and eat and eat and eat and eat and then throw up mm -hmm. or people with anorexia they expect to have major eyes about it but if they think of the balance and just being kind to themselves and just saying okay you know i have this challenge and i'm really going to do the very best i can and people who are you know obese and they're they've been on a diet and they've lost weight and think okay i know i'm going to lose maybe a little bit of weight but it doesn't have to be an excuse to get off whatever wagon somebody's on and dive into whatever the addiction or whatever the, the challenge is, saying, I've all of January. So, yeah, managing our expectations and getting a balance. The next one I chose was honouring what Christmas means to you. So, like a few years ago, I made a list of things that I actually do enjoy about Christmas. And then I tried to make it kind of focus on those things and actually enjoy those things. So some of the things would be like the Christmas tree. I love the Christmas tree. I just feel like it makes the house, you know, magical. Yeah. So we go and get a Christmas tree every year and we make it like our own tradition. And I suppose a big change for me as well was like recognizing I'm an adult now. It's about making my own traditions. It's not about the past, I suppose. Do you know? Yes. Yes. So yeah, the tree, food, obviously love food. Um, then I mentioned before our chat that we got married at Christmas. So that now I have like a positive Christmas memory and that we're going to have like our anniversary every year at Christmas so like we plan to like do something every year around that um yeah I think I think that's really powerful to like maybe sit down and actually make a list every year you're putting so much pressure on yourself what do you actually enjoy about it and then make those things make time for those things yes yeah um I, I absolutely agree with you and for me and as I was saying, midnight mass. Now, a lot of people don't go to mass and that's fine. But there's maybe other things like what does Christmas represent? So if it's family, if it's getting together, if it's for some people, some people enjoy the kind of the when things stop and they more um, like being on their own for Christmas Day. I know a few people who do that and they deliberately choose to spend that time away from everybody else. But whatever it is, really reflecting on that. And, and my dad, um, I remember, again, as I was saying to you, I just didn't like Christmas and I'd be the rush. And I used to think if there was, I was eight, nine, ten, feeling really cross with all these people <laughs> thinking, you know, because I could see how tired my parents were and thinking, you know, if we if we didn't have Christmas, then they wouldn't be. Bye, and, then, <laughs> yeah, and, I, and I remember it. And it, like, those were the days when people didn't have a TV and they bought it for Christmas. So it was a huge thing. So dad was out, you know, putting delivering Christmas trees at literally 11 o'clock on Christmas Eve. And then we come home from mass and there'd be somebody there that, that it didn't work. And, you know, um, so I had this huge thing about it, you know. And then dad was saying that, no, he had a completely different view. Now, I wasn't thinking in terms of the, the commercial piece that obviously, you know, there's a busy time of year and they're in business and they needed to be selling all of these. But, but more so, dad would always have time when people come into the shop and um, around Christmas and he'd chat to them and he'd talk to the children about Santi and he'd... Uh, and I remember him clearly lots of times saying that it, it, it would be a very lonely year if people didn't have Christmas because it's an opportunity for people to go that extra mile for their neighbours, to say thank you, to give, um, say happy Christmas, to send a Christmas card. And I mean, it was a joke in our family because I don't think dad ever sent a Christmas card in his life, but he would <laughs> chat to people, because mum would do it, but he would chat to people about it and about the meaning of getting it. And, and I know for me, I'm really touched way more so this year, um, not having sent any Christmas cards yet, but just receiving them and going, wow, you know, that people are organized and they're thoughtful and they're, but a text the same or a phone call the same so there's a real beautiful loveliness and and I think the way that we as adults can create a sense of it's a special time for children and I have so many wonderful memories as a child you know sliding down the banister on Christmas morning and all of those all of the excitement and coming back to that's what it's about you know it's it's not about the the rush and the fuss and the well for some people it is for me it isn't and I'm then reminding myself and and I just love Christmas, Christmas dinner, family, looking around. And when my dad died, I remember that first Christmas being very, very, very difficult. And we all missed him so much. And we established new rituals and we went up um, and said a prayer at his grave. And then we come back and then we had Christmas. And yeah, and so I think it just it depends on where, where, where we are. And there, there are some people who this Christmas, somebody might be very ill, somebody might be dying, 
and there is a sense of gosh this is very 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 special time so for people who are Christians who believe in the Christ bit, reminding, well, what is Christmas? And as I was saying in that list of suggestions, in America, they've taken Christmas out and they have happy holiday. So they're not offensive to anyone. But they've the build up for weeks and weeks and weeks. And then on Christmas Day, what they call Boxing Day, St. Stephen's Day, and all the decorations are gone. And then it's, it's over. The season is over and you're into the next one. So what's fabulous about Ireland is we have a season. It's not just a day. There's a few days busy and then there's this just lovely, lovely few days for a lot of people afterwards where it's a little bit quieter. Mm -hmm. Have I told you how amazing you are doing these podcasts? I have, but I know I have. I know I have, but I want to put I want to put on record. So while you're thinking of something to say, I want to put on record. You really are. Like I just think it is such a brave thing to do. And a really um, amazing thing that you've done. And I've, I've listened to someone over the year and you're doing a wonderful service for yourself, but also for psychology. And um, so I just really want to thank you for that, Deirdre. Thank you. Well, yeah, I was going to say, I suppose if, if you're religious, it could be a really nice anchor to focus on. Like what you mentioned in one of the articles was start on the article was starting on the 8th and that's Christmas and having your advent calendar and having your midnight mass but also if you're not religious if you look back at the history of it like there would have been a celtic tradition around this time as well where mm. the real meaning of it is, is like it's the darkest time of the year so <laughs> it's like celebrating from monday now the 21st it's going to be getting brighter every day and recognizing that we're coming out of the winter and i love january as well actually because i just love like new beginnings and stuff so i suppose that's really the meaning of it it's not um it's not to just run around trying to buy stuff you know <laughs> Yeah, or, absolutely. Yeah. And, and recognizing, you know, I, I, coming back to that, again, with the expectations, we are all different, you know, individual differences, we're all different. So some people like beginning, some people put up the Christmas tree in November, goodness knows why, but some people do. And it's Claire, very judgmental. But, <laughs> um, and some people leave them up until, you know, the end of January, and some people take them down the next day. We're all different. We're different in our expectations and our traditions and what we like. And I think coming back to allowing others to be however they are and being kind and compassionate to ourselves about whatever however we are and that's that's one of the kind of the, the nice things I think about getting older realize that a bit more and uh, the next two kind of I picked were creating traditions and enjoying creating new memories so I think like for people like us who've had a bereavement you can kind of get into a trap of thinking like that's it now, Christmas can never be the same again, you know, whereas yeah. good things can happen in the future as well. You know, limiting beliefs can hold you back as well from enjoying Christmas, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. And I remember somebody saying to me once, they, they, or maybe it's in Shadowlands, actually, I think it's, um, it is, it's in the movie Shadowlands. They, the happiness now is part of the pain then. Mm -hmm. And if families, when, when, we, when someone we love dies, and we miss them and we grieve them, that's because we love them so much. And so that's a pain. That's a physical, physical pain. And if we were delighted and that they were gone, well, then that wouldn't make sense. You know, if we love them, it wouldn't make sense. So allowing ourselves to really acknowledge, yes, that that person is missing and, and looking at how, how we're going to, to get through it. But we're resilient. Everybody's resilient. And the thing that life teaches us is that death is part of life and somehow creating new memories and and i think children and families are amazing because they're they help if if there are parents who've lost one of their own parents of course they want to miss their own parents but they want to help their children enjoy christmas so it kind of forces them in, into making the best and i think really that's probably the, the, the thing that we do we make the best of it but we kind of fun when you were saying about making traditions in my head it was, was fun christmas is fun too and it is a time where we're together and like certainly from March right through some families have spent a lot of time together and some people have spent absolutely no time together. So this is a celebration in, in whatever way it is, whether it's a family appearing at a window and, and waving because they've been able to drive three hours, but they don't want to go in 
or they're coming in with masks waving and going, but celebrating that, that we can do that. And, and, and again, you know, the virtual hug bit, having a bit of fun around it, I think it's so important. So one year out of the blue, uh, years and years ago, we were having Christmas dinner and we were just finishing. And my mother said um, to my sister and I, um, and me, okay, come on, um, it's the, the men do the wash up. And my two brothers, it was a long time ago, my two brothers and my dad looked and said, what? And mom said, yeah, she said, it's tradition at Christmas. The men do the wash up. <laughs> the three of them said, no, it's not. And mom just said, well, it's a new tradition. <laughs> so, so as they've gone off and gone, got married and gone their own ways, I, I think that tradition went by the wayside. But for a few years, it was great. It was, you know, it's the tradition at Christmas is the men do the wash up. So we can have fun creating new traditions in, in whatever way they are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely think that. Um, it's funny you said the dinner as well. Like I think sometimes at Christmas dinner, it's like you put so much pressure on the Christmas dinner as if you're running a hotel or something when it's actually just for you. You know, it's like <laughs> if you simplify the dinner as well and make it easier. <laughs> um, well, I have that down to a fine art. Really? What do you do? Yeah. I Order it. <laughs> <laughs> So I can cook, but nobody in my family knows I can cook. So I'm actually a good cook, I think, but nobody knows it. So I just don't get fussed about it. I do the wash up and I'm actually aware recently and Emma, Emma Barnes organized a lovely, lovely get together for volunteers to acknowledge that the, the work that they do for aware and the huge contribution. So she had us in small groups in chat rooms. And one of the icebreakers was, would you be the person um, making the Christmas dinner or doing the wash up? And that was so easy for me. It was not the wash up. <laughs> and I enjoy it. And I put the music on and it's just, again, my kind of peace and quiet time. So that's my way out of the Christmas dinner. I know there's some people who can't do that because they're, they're, you know, that they need to, but mm. being kind. And for anyone struggling, Claire, what services do Aware have throughout Christmas that are available? Yeah, that's a great, that's a great question. And um, I hope it's okay to mention that you volunteered with Aware and, and thank you for that as well. And like the, the people who volunteer are, are amazing. The, the support line is available right through Christmas. And then there's, huge amount of resources on the on the aware website and silver cloud have the what's called life skills program so that's a cognitive behavior program that's eight sessions it's evidence-based it's excellent and people can do it on their own or with the support of an aware volunteer so certainly the days before the days after the, the aware volunteer i'm not sure about the, the christmas day itself i don't think so but the but the resources are there and then there's dr chris williams developed the um, living life to the full that aware calls life skills and the group life skills and that is now on zoom and i really encourage everybody to do that it's for people with mild to moderate depression but you know anybody can take that box i think it's it's there's so much that we can learn from it but then Silver Cloud have come up with new resources as well that are on the Wear website. So space for so space for sleep and space for balance. And then there are lectures that Aware has collected over the number of years where people have voluntarily given lectures for, as part of the St. Pat's lecture, the Aware lecture series that were held in St. Pat's Hospital every year. And, and they're there. And there's a webinar that a conversation that I really enjoyed. Nadine Ferris France is the director of Global Network Ireland. And every Friday since March, Nadine has been facilitating a webinar on COVID-19, an international webinar, and it's just phenomenal. She talks, she's spoken to so many people from so many different perspectives. And for me, listening to them, it's given me a sense of that it's not Ireland, it's not just Ireland, we are, it really is a global pandemic and it's given me a sense of being part of, being on the planet, being part of this global network of people who are experiencing similar challenges. So I was fascinated to know what, what has Nadine found most helpful or what has struck her most during the year as she's been listening to all of these people week after week after week. So facilitate a conversation with Nadine and Dr. Keith Gaynor and Keith is involved in where he's volunteering the board and he's also principal psychologist in clinical psychologist in St. John of God's and it's lovely so it's looking at how people can how any of us can help manage our own well-being develop our own resilience during the um, this this very 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 challenging time so that's a resource that certainly I find I, I highly recommend for people if they're experiencing difficulties and even if they're not I think it's good. What I always say to you as well Kara is like don't be afraid to call the helpline 
Do you know, like you don't have to be, you know, really, really, you know, about suicidal or something to call the helpline. You can just call and say you're having a tough day and they'll talk to you, won't they? Of course they will. And actually just on that, I know I'm on my hobby horse. In my view, um, just with language, you know what I'm going to say. <laughs> the, oh. the, the word around suicide, there's a lot of power in that word and a lot of fear mm-hmm. and a lot of confusion. And any of us at any point could think as adults, you know, we're better off dead or what would it be like if we weren't here or we've had enough or whatever. We can have horrible thoughts in our head. Some people get confused and they think if they have those thoughts, they're suicidal. And they talk about feeling suicidal. And people say, do you feel suicidal? In my view, there's no such thing as feeling suicidal. They're thoughts. So they're not nice thoughts, helpful thoughts, but they're thoughts. So people can have those thoughts. They can feel worried, upset, shocked, frightened, or relieved. The people who feel relieved are the ones I worry about. But just because people think they're better off dead, number one, doesn't mean they're suicidal. And number two, does not mean they have to harm themselves because there are always options. The tragedy is people have taken their their own life, not because they were suicidal, but because they thought they were, particularly if they had alcohol in their system. And really, this is one of the the key reasons I encourage people not to drink alcohol, because it takes the brakes off and people harm themselves in a way under the influence of alcohol that they wouldn't have otherwise. so that's that's that one and there was something else that i was going to say i know i'm talking a lot to address so oh, yeah, okay. just oh, that it's okay to call the helpline i think because a lot of people stop themselves. Yes. So the, the other think, thing i was going to say i'm not quote unquote bad enough to call the helpline uh, they're not going to say you don't have any problems don't call us again <laughs> last week i had the privilege of sitting in on um one of the aware support groups that they're on zoom now Mm-hmm. And I just wanted to have, have a sense. I sat in on lots and lots of face-to-face groups over the years, and I just want to have a sense of what's the, how, how the Zoom going. And it was a huge privilege. And there were a number of people attending the group who were talking about how they had phoned the Aware Support Line and how they, they got help and how they were able to, to help other people. And then recently I was interviewed on, by Matt Cooper with a man, Cullum, who volunteers on the Aware, um, with the Aware Services. And he was... He spoke, so I'm not betraying um, any confidentiality, because, um, breaking any confidentiality because he was very open about it, but he spoke about how he was experiencing difficulties and he phoned the Aware Support Line and got the help that was made a difference to him at that particular time. And then he wanted a volunteer to, to give something back. So it's not that people have to volunteer, but very much to your point, people are listened to with respect and there's some... The training is fantastic, and I know I'm biased, but but it, you know I think it is, and I think people, yeah, I'd encourage people, that, particularly on Christmas Day, if they're feeling alone, and you know there's the Samaritans, there's the Alone Organization, there's Aware, and but phoning a friend, you know, just lifting up the the, the phone and saying, you know, I was just thinking of you, wonder how things are going, and we can be slow to do that, and in the getting help, we give help people get help but the most important thing is to take help and that can be particularly for any of us in the giving help business it can be really difficult to take help and that can be one of the biggest gifts that anyone of any of us can take to actually take help from others yeah definitely i think that's all the points that i chose because i didn't have time for 17 but the art was amazing I'll share it <laughs> in the notes. but i your original point that like we should think of the people that are here this Christmas that wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the sacrifices that we all made over the year, especially obviously frontline workers and mental health workers and things. I think that's really beautiful. And just that we got through the year, you know, and 2021 will be better, hopefully. <laughs> and and ce- celebrating that we got through the year, yeah. that we really did. And, and it's really struck by your expectations question. So the, the one, the people that we didn't mention, the teenagers, and there can be a, a, a kind of an expectation that they're going to behave, that they're going to be polite, they're going to be civil, they're going to be, you know, and some of them are, and some of them are, you know, moody. And, and, and there's a tiredness that everybody has and a sense of, you know, this isn't fair. And, you know, so, so certainly acknowledging that. And I know you were, were saying at the outset, Deirdre, to kind of wrap up with, you know, some practical CBT skills, thoughts, feelings, actions. What I'd love to do would be to just give you and um, share with you the what I've now called, not the coping sentence, the ABC coping sentence. So it's the third step in how I, I like to explain the basic principles of CBT. So A is acknowledge. I feel upset. I feel tired. I feel hungry. I feel however we feel. I feel lonely. I feel upset. B, because. So because of COVID-19 or because I think this isn't going to be such a good Christmas. And putting I think in there rather than the fact, because it's our thoughts that can cause the problems a lot of the time. 
I feel sad because I think Christmas isn't going to be the same this year without whoever it is, the person we love. And then C is choose. So what are we going to choose to do? So acknowledging our feelings, because if we don't acknowledge them, they don't go away, they bottle up and they come out in all kinds of ways. And then linking them to either what's happened or happening and or what we're thinking. So A, acknowledge, I feel upset, I feel under pressure, I feel overwhelmed, B, because I think Christmas is just too much of this or because, and some people, because Christmas is going to be over. For some people, it's the opposite. December gives them the energy and the idea of coming to Christmas Day, they're heartbroken. How are they going to wait another 365 days before next Christmas? So I feel upset because I think this, but, and then C is choose. I choose to be kind to myself. I choose to breathe slowly. I choose to give myself a break. And when my auntie Noreen died, I was so, 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 so upset and missed her for so long and still do. But the book that helped me was when I thought about it, but I am blessed to have had her in my life. Mm -hmm. And when I thought about that, that was so true that every time I thought that, it kind of gave me, yes, absolutely. And I use it with my dad. And there are a few other buts that I have with, you know, that, that when I feel sad and I miss dad, I think, yes, but. And then when I think of the but, I go, yeah, that's true. That's true. So it's not dismissing the feelings of sadness. It's not dismissing the feelings of pressure. So I feel stressed because I think I'm never going to get it done. But I choose to do what I can. But I choose to allow this year to be different. But I choose to learn from it. But I choose to make this count. But I choose to have fun. I choose to um, remember it's not all about me or Christmas or presents or whatever. I choose to look at the bigger picture. And for some people on a very basic level, but I choose to get through it. And if that's what, that's what their thought is, well, then that's the one that they use. So I don't know if there's anything else you want to ask me. No, but, um, that's all. Thanks so much. Sarah. I want to keep it at like a, a shareable yeah, link. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, thank you so much for your time. And Merry Christmas. And Gormila Mahogat. And have a lovely, lovely Christmas. You too. Thanks so much, Claire. Thank you.